Well, good day and welcome to the Johnson Space Center for today's first status briefing of the STS-132 mission, Atlantis' flight to the International Space Station. Almost 24 hours into the mission and with us today to discuss the day's events and upcoming activities is the lead space shuttle flight director, Mike Serafin. Well, uh, thank you for tuning in to this second day of the flight of Atlantis to the International Space Station during the STS-132 mission. Uh, some days in space flight are easier than others, and today is one of those days where uh, we've run into a couple of problems that we're tracking, uh, specifically a, uh, a piece of space debris that uh, we're watching that uh, will be in proximity to the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle after uh, docking tomorrow, as well as uh, some difficulties we ran into with respect to the uh, inspection of Atlantis's heat shield today. Uh, overall, we're proceeding towards docking tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, we expect to uh, be able to dock with the International Space Station, and uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about the, uh, the two items that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'll uh, first uh, provide a brief uh, video clip of some uh, items that occurred earlier today during the timeline. If we could queue up the video, I'll, uh, I'll show you one of the rendezvous burns we did earlier today. Uh, early on, uh, shortly after crew wake up, we fired up the uh, right orbital maneuvering system. And here you can see some video the crew took out the uh, back window. Uh, we fired the uh, engine uh, for just uh, a handful of seconds to raise the altitude of Atlantis. And then uh, once that was complete, uh, we took the shuttle's arm and maneuvered it across the payload bay to grapple the uh, shuttle's orbiter boom sensor system to uh, begin the heat shield inspection. Uh, while doing that, uh, the uh, checkout of the orbiter boom, uh, we ran into a couple of difficulties that caused us to uh, use a backup mode. Uh, you see the video here of a uh, digital camera that uh, does not reside on uh, what we call a pan tilt unit, which is a means of gimbling uh, the primary sensor on the end of the boom. Uh, today, when we took the boom out and started to inspect the heat shield, uh, the crew noted that they couldn't get to the desired uh, angles on the, uh, on the pan and tilt unit, or basically gimbal the, the cameras and sensors on the end of the uh, boom to the desired position. And uh, after some troubleshooting, we pulled the, uh, the boom up over the side of the payload bay so that we could observe it not only from the, uh, the flight deck windows uh, with eyeballs and binoculars and uh, digital cameras, but also with the payload bay cameras. And we determined that uh, we had quite literally run into a snag with the, uh, with the uh, gimbal system on the end of the boom. Uh, one of the cables on the end of the boom is uh, pulling taut and causing us to not be able to tilt the, uh, the uh, the camera system, our primary camera system, fully up, which is affecting our ability to see all of the heat shield on Atlantis. So uh, what we've done is uh, we've gone to a secondary mode, uh, which is a different camera. It's a digital camera that is hard mounted to the boom. It doesn't sit on this uh, pan and tilt unit. And uh, we're proceeding with the inspection of the uh, starboard wing. Uh, we completed that earlier today before I came over to this press conference. Uh, we're currently in the process of scanning the nose cap, uh, the uh, reinforced carbon carbon on the, on the nose cap. And we expect to get the, the majority of the port wing uh, uh, reinforced carbon carbon later. The team is looking at uh, all of that imagery data. They'll uh, review that via the standard review process uh, over the next day or so in combination with all of the uh, launch imagery and the uh, imagery that we'll obtain during tomorrow's approach to the International Space Station, the rendezvous pitch maneuver. Uh, so once we get all that imagery on the ground, the team will determine if we need to go get additional uh, information or views of Atlantis before uh, we're ready to declare the, uh, the heat shield ready to go and uh, to bring Atlantis home, or if uh, we've got all of what we need. Uh, on the, uh, on the uh, side of the uh, conjunction, the piece of space debris that we're uh, watching, there's a uh, piece of debris from an unknown origin that uh, has a very, uh, what we call elliptical orbit. It, it uh, ranges from several thousand miles above the International Space Station to uh, just below the International Space Station in its orbit. Uh, we, know what, we know that this object is there, but we don't know the source of it. And uh, we uh, know that it's gonna come in relatively co close proximity to the International Space Station tomorrow, about an hour after the shuttle is planned to dock with the space station. Uh, so what we've done is uh, we've developed a uh, parallel path. Uh, we've got a plan to do a debris avoidance maneuver if it's necessary, and we've got a plan to just uh, proceed with the rendezvous today uh, and tomorrow as planned. 
uh, and the determination in whether or not we need to lower the altitude of station to avoid this debris uh, that will uh, come in close proximity shortly after docking tomorrow will be made uh, later today. Uh, if the debris avoidance maneuver is required, it will occur uh, roughly 8.07 central time uh, this evening. And uh, we'll just continue to watch it. Uh, we've got some uh, tracking on this uh, object. And uh, right now it's right on the threshold of whether or not we need to take any action at all. Uh, that threshold is around 10 kilometers in distance. And uh, we're just gonna basically get as much information as we can before we uh, determine whether or not uh, we need to maneuver station and then modify the shuttle's approach to the International Space Station tomorrow or whether we can proceed as planned uh, and go to uh, station at its current higher altitude. So uh, we've worked through those anomalies today. We still have some forward work ahead of us. Uh, in addition to all those activities, uh, the crew uh, checked out three of the uh, spacesuits, uh, two that are planned for use during this mission, as well as a spare that we plan to leave on the International Space Station, as well as uh, the uh, rescue unit called SAFER that uh, is used during the spacewalk. Uh, all those items checked out just fine. Uh, the crew, again, is proceeding towards rendezvous and docking tomorrow as planned, and uh, we've got uh, some open work ahead of us uh, associated with the uh, heat shield inspection. And with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, Mike, thanks. Uh, we'll take questions here in Houston, then go to a handful of reporters on our phone bridge, and we'll go here to Mark. Uh, thank you, it's Mark Caro for uh, Aviation Week, and I have a couple of questions. Can you, uh, in broad strokes, compare the effectiveness of the inspection strategy that you're uh, executing today as compared to the one you would normally, uh, normally do? Yeah, that's a uh, good question. Normally we use a, uh, a laser range imager called, uh, or the acronym is LDRI. Um, that sits on this pan tilt unit and it provides uh, a little bit more coverage of all of the thermal blankets and the heat shield on board Atlantis. Um, the uh, intensified uh, digital camera or a, 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 a digital camera that we're using today that does not sit on that pan tilt unit uh, is a higher res resolution uh, camera, but it provides less coverage. Uh, so what we're doing is we're getting all the, the critical areas, the areas that we require very high resolution imagery of the heat shield because we have lower damage tolerances in those areas, specifically the, the lower side of the reinforced carbon, the hot panels uh, in the middle of the wing uh, near the apex. And uh, we're getting that imagery using the, uh, the, uh, the digital camera and uh, we'll let the, uh, team review those on both the port and the starboard wing as well as the nose cap. Uh, it's a little bit less coverage. Uh, we didn't get the uh, T0 umbilicals that sit on both sides uh, of the ohms pod and all the ohms pod imagery today. Uh, we have an opportunity to get some of that via the uh, space station assets, either uh, the rendezvous pitch maneuver uh, uh, and digital still images taken by the uh, International Space Station crew during the approach tomorrow. We also have the ability to use any number of external cameras on the space station as well as uh, robotic assets, either the uh, station arm, the uh, Japanese arm, or uh, the uh, uh, mobile transporter cameras out there tomorrow. And uh, we're just looking at a combination of all the assets available to uh, determine what, the, what gaps we have in our coverage because we used only the uh, the hard-mounted camera on the boom today uh, and what we can fill in uh, tomorrow or uh, in days following on board uh, using the uh, International Space Station assets. So it's, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. We have a little bit better coverage using the, uh, the, uh, the planned camera, but it's higher resolution imagery using the, uh, the uh, camera that we use today. Thanks, and just to follow that, if it was necessary to to do a focused inspection to sort of follow, follow up, um, when would that fall in the timeline and, and what would be affected at this point? Uh, it's a good question. We have a, a reserve time on the uh, fifth day of the mission, so it would be after we install the uh, RASVET module on the International Space Station. Uh, late that day on flight day five, we have about an hour and a half of uh, crew time set aside to, to perform a focus inspection if that's required. Uh, again, it's too early to tell whether we'll need to go down that path. Um, 
because one, we haven't in, uh, reviewed all the imagery from Ascent, uh, as well as the, uh, the digital camera imagery from today, and we still have the RPM imagery ahead of us tomorrow. Um, and then we may be able to obtain other imagery uh, from station without uh, focus inspection later. Okay, we'll go to the reporters on our phone bridge, and uh, if you can hear me, we'll start off with Marsha Dunn of the Associated Press. Marsha? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Marsha. A um, couple of questions. Um, quick question on the space debris. Do you have any idea how big or small that piece might be? I don't have any of that information, Marsha. We just know that it's big enough to track and uh, that we have a fairly good idea of of its orbit relative to the uh, International Space Station, but I don't know its size or origin. And um, regarding uh, today's problem with the um, the boom, I'm wondering um, how you think this snag might have occurred, getting pinched like that. Would that have been something that happened prior to liftoff when everything was being installed? And if you don't get all of the port wing done today, um, when would you do it or would you just not do it. Uh, we will uh, get all the imagery for the uh, port wing uh, via some method. Uh, there's already some discussion of using the, uh, the high power uh, digital still cameras from the International Space Station during the approach tomorrow uh, and just having an extra crew member snap those images. Uh, if we don't get what we need there, uh, we have a, a number of options including focus inspection, but again, it's too early to tell there. Um, how did the snag happen? It's really too early to tell. Uh, we just know that the cable is routed in such a manner that it's pulling on the back side of the camera and, and doesn't allow us to tilt up. Uh, we do have a, a digital still image of the, uh, of the pan tilt unit. Uh, on the uh, right side of your screen, uh, you can see a Canada, I don't know, a little bit past 90 degrees is the, uh, the laser uh, dynamic range imager as well as the intensified uh, television camera, which is a low light uh, imagery camera on the end of the pan tilt unit. Uh, it kind of narrows down and then towards the left hand side of your screen is the structure on the end of the uh, boom. Uh, running between the two, running between the structure of the boom and the, uh, the pan tilt unit on the camera, you can see some cables routed and uh, for some reason there's a, a cannon connector, a big round metal connector that sits on the, on the side of the camera, on the right hand side there, that uh, is pulling taut and, and not allowing us to get full range of motion on that camera. Um, it's too early to tell if uh, it happened uh, prior to launch or whether just due to the, the shake and rattle and roll of launch uh, that uh, the, the cable got into a position that uh, wasn't good for the uh, inspection. Uh, the crew did try to manipulate the camera around uh, so that the, the cable would come free and we didn't have any success in that today. We, we spent uh, probably about two orbits uh, worth of time, roughly three hours today, uh, trying to troubleshoot uh, and get this uh, snag free on that cable and we had no, uh, no luck with that. So um, we've got uh, lots of time to solve this problem prior to uh, bringing Atlantis home. Uh, we've got, uh, again, uh, a number of assets available on the International Space Station, and we'll just see uh, what coverage we get with the, the planned surveys that we've got and then determine if any uh, further action is required. Thank you. And, and lastly, I think Ken Ham called down at one point that he thought that a spacewalker could just sort of smooth that out. Um, would that always be a last-ditch alternative if you really needed a proper laser image? Uh, we do need to uh, discuss what to do with respect to uh, late inspection. Uh, you know, we do have uh, an orbital debris environment. There's a lot of space junk and micrometeoroids and other items up there uh, that we need to manage. And uh, there's a number of ways to do that. Our primary method of doing that is using the, uh, the uh, sensors and cameras on the end of that pan tilt unit. And uh, that was our plan going into the flight. Um, now, whether the appropriate course of action is to go out and do a spacewalk and, and just kind of move that cable, or uh, whether it's best to just leave that alone due to, due to risks associated with that uh, is yet to be determined. I know folks are off talking about that, and uh, we're, we're investigating all of our options. Uh, our first spacewalk is uh, a little over two days from now, and, and we probably wouldn't do anything any earlier than our second spacewalk on uh, flight day six uh, if we were to need to uh, manipulate this uh, this cable, 
But again, uh, that's work that's in front of us, and I know a number of the team members are off looking at that already. Okay, next up is Claire Moskowitz, space.com. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you have an idea of when you might be able to make the decision about whether a debris avoidance maneuver is needed? Uh, yes, uh, we've got a, uh, a plan in place to determine whether or not the debris avoidance maneuver is required. Uh, the debris avoidance maneuver, again, is, is scheduled to occur at about 8.07 Central and about three hours prior to that, around, roughly around 5 p.m. Central, uh, a decision will be made as to whether we actually lower the altitude of the uh, space station roughly uh, half a nautical mile uh, in orbit or whether we leave it uh, in its planned place. So about three hours prior to the debris avoidance maneuver is, uh, is what we're planning. We've got uh, both plans out there and, and we just need to decide which uh, path to go down based on uh, all the latest information and we've got some hours uh, ahead of us to make that decision. Thanks. Okay, next is Bill Harwood from CBS News. Yeah, hi, Mike, uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. Um, do you have a, a, a missed distance or where this debris would be in the box uh, uh, for this maneuver? Bill, we do. Uh, the missed distance is right on the edge of our, uh, our criteria to maneuver out of the way of it. Uh, it's right around 10 kilometers in missed distance. Uh, a complicating factor in uh, determining whether a debris avoidance maneuver is required is uh, when, when the shuttle docks with the International Space Station, uh, it takes uh, some amount of time to uh, hard mate the two vehicles. We need to uh, uh, retract the ring and then close some hooks that provide a good structural uh, load path. And then we do uh, a uh, pressure check between the two, uh, the two vehicles to make sure that they're, they're sealed properly. Um, and then uh, we maneuver the whole stack, uh, the shuttle and station, to attitude, and that takes a finite amount of time. We're talking about a million pounds of spacecraft that we need to get into. It's, uh, it's what we call uh, docked or uh, mated attitude, which ranges uh, in, in time from uh, 15 minutes to 45 minutes in duration. So we're kind of cutting it close uh, as to whether or not we can dock and then uh, get structurally mated to the International Sta Space Station and then into the docked uh, attitude uh, relative to this debris avoidance maneuver. So folks looked at that uh, within the last day and determined that we really can't get confident that if we need to get out of the way of this piece of uh, space debris, that uh, we'll be able to do that after the shuttle docks just due to the timeline and the amount of time available. It's a very compressed window. Um, so folks just decided that it was appropriate to maneuver station before the shuttle ever got there and then we would modify the shuttle's trajectory uh, and just come in a little bit lower uh, in, in altitude to the International Space Station. Thanks, um, but it's 10 kilometers is, is where you stand, six miles roughly right now is what you think the missed distance is. That's correct, and uh, you know, with some of these objects up there, uh, they're moving at such high rates, and of course the, uh, the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle are moving at 17,500 miles an hour. Uh, just a, a small error in the amount of time that uh, we determine where something is could make a big difference in your total missed distance. It, you know, a couple of seconds at that speed could mean you miss by a huge amount of distance or you miss uh, by a very little distance. So uh, that's being factored into the debris avoidance maneuver plan. Uh, there's an uncertainty range that we use to determine whether or not to uh, get out of the way of, of something. And uh, folks are using that along with all of the, the tracking information that we're getting from, uh, from the piece of space junk that's out there to determine whether or not we need to maneuver. Thanks. And one last one for me, just to be sure I understood your, your analysis of the flight day two inspection. What you're saying is that regardless of what it takes to fix this, you're confident you're going to get all the data you need in the end. I mean, there's nothing that you're visualizing that you're not going to get because of this. Thanks. Yeah, the, the team obviously is a world-class team, a very talented team, and uh, we've got some of the best engineers and imagery analysts on the planet to supporting uh, Atlantis uh, as well as the International Space Station. Um, I'm confident that uh, given a little bit of time uh, we'll come up with a solution that will cover the entire heat shield on Atlantis and we'll get there uh, well in advance of when a decision is required to bring her home. Uh, we just need to give that process a little bit of time. We need to give those folks a little bit of time. Uh, the problem that we're dealing with has only uh, reared its head in uh, the last eight or ten hours and uh, I bet you given a day uh, things will come together very quickly. 
Okay, next up, Todd Halverson from Florida today. Um, hi, Todd Halverson of Florida Today. Um, I, I was wondering, if, if, Mike, if you could um, re recall for me the evolution of the sensors on the um, inspection boom. Um, if I recall, was this camera that was hard mounted, it, was that an, an initial camera that was used uh, during return to flight and then something better came along or LDRI came along uh, on lighter flights. I'm just trying to remember the evolution of these sensors. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when uh, we were in the return to flight process, uh, obviously uh, time and schedule and budget were, uh, were of essence. And uh, what we did at the time was uh, procured a number of imaging systems. Uh, there was the uh, intensified camera that we've used for years in the payload bay. It's a low light uh, camera that has uh, high resolution and low light. Uh, there's the laser dynamic range imager, which uh, sits on this pan tilt unit that was a new sensor that came along after return to flight. Uh, there's this digital camera that we use today, and then there's a laser uh, camera system that came along. Uh, we uh, basically used all of those uh, during the return to flight missions just to kind of test out the systems and make sure that we understood uh, which ones operated best during day and nighttime and which one we could use to most efficiently uh, perform the heat shield inspection uh, following the uh, Columbia accident. And uh, what it turned out to be was that the, uh, the uh, LDRI imager, the laser dynamic range imager, uh, has its own illumination source uh, which uh, it basically illuminates its target. And we decided that that was the best to get the entire heat shield inspected within the time available or most efficiently uh, inspect the heat shield uh, uh, without impacting the cruise day. And the reason that we determined that was because you could use that guy during day or night uh, because it had its own illumination source. The, uh, the digital camera that we use today to do the uh, heat shield inspection is only usable while it has an illumination source, either from the LDRI, which we tried to position uh, to illuminate uh, or provide an illumination source for the digital camera, but we just physically couldn't position it uh, because of this uh, pan tilt problem and, and it didn't allow us to gimbal the uh, illumination source towards, the, uh, towards what the camera was seeing. Um, so we ended up uh, going to just taking images using the, uh, the digital camera during the day pass. So roughly half of your orbit is when you're allowed to gather imagery. So now if you're going through 16 orbits a day uh, and seeing 16 sunrises and sunsets, half of your day is no longer available to you if you use the digital camera to uh, inspect the heat shield. So uh, there were a number of considerations. Um, resolution was also another consideration uh, because we have to have uh, real high uh, detail imagery of, uh, in, in particular, the reinforced carbon carbon. Uh, when uh, we looked at that, uh, the, again, the LDRI uh, came out at the top in terms of giving us the resolution that we wanted and then uh, determining whether or not we needed to go inspect it further, we could go use some of the other uh, assets, uh, the intensified uh, television camera, the laser camera system, and uh, go gather imagery with that. And then uh, the last consideration was uh, how fast could we maneuver the arm while gathering the imagery. Uh, because the LDRI uses a streaming video, uh, that allowed us to send that down in real time as opposed to the the laser camera system that takes a snapshot and uh, you have to basically maneuver the arm only so fast so that the snapshots occur so you don't have gaps in your coverage. Uh, the uh, the uh, digital camera also has a similar uh, uh, limitation where it takes snapshots and you need to maneuver the arm such that there is overlap in the imagery. So there were a whole bunch of considerations and folks uh, tested all those out during return to flight STS-114 and STS-121 and uh, that led us to use an LDRI uh, for the, the remainder of the uh, shuttle missions. Uh, thanks very much and I just have a couple more. Um, the first one is, uh, did you see anything at all during your uh, surveys today that um, uh, jumped out at you or, or looked as if it might be damaged that uh, might require extra um, an extra look? Uh, yeah, regarding the uh, 
information we gathered today, the imagery we gathered today, um, we saw only a limited subset of that information uh, on the ground. Uh, most of that will be uh, sent to the ground via the uh, laptop computer system later today. Uh, of the imagery that I saw, I didn't see anything that was obvious that would give me concern regarding the uh, health of uh, Atlantis or its heat shield. Um, again, we'll, uh, we'll let the imagery analyst uh, review all that data. There's, a, there's uh, probably more data than they know what to do with right now, uh, but I'm sure they'll find a way to get through it all. They always do uh, within the next day, day and a half. And uh, once they do that, we'll make a final determination as to whether there's any uh, further work that we need to do to clear Atlantis before return, either via focus inspection or, or uh, other action. Thanks. And the last one for me is, um, uh, if you uh, make the, if, if the station guys make a debris avoidance maneuver, or if they don't, um, what impact do, uh, would, would there be on the crew and rendezvous uh, procedures? I mean, would the timing of burns be different? I'm just trying to get an idea of uh, how this will impact their rendezvous day. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, with respect to uh, changing the orbit of station, you know, uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to change where station is in the sky, and uh, that's something that we don't normally do uh, for a, a space shuttle mission. From the time that we launch until the time that the shuttle arrives, the space station is normally always in the same position, and we don't change its altitude, or uh, we try to minimize the, amount, the number of propulsive events propulsive events that can change its position in the sky. Uh, so this case is a little bit unique in that uh, we may actually change the altitude of the International Space Station. So the impact to the rendezvous tomorrow is that we'll use the standard procedures and standard process to track uh, the position of the International Space Station and then tell the crew where uh, station is relative to the uh, altitude changes that Atlantis needs to perform. Uh, the only difference is that the timing of the burn will change by a couple of minutes and the actual magnitude of the burn will, will actually decrease slightly uh, because the altitude of the International Space Station will be lower. Thanks very much. Okay, and finally on the phone bridge, Robert Perlman. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, sure can, Robert. Great. Um, Mike, Rob Perlman with uh, CollectSpace.com. Uh, with regards to the pinch, uh, pinch cable, uh, are there any concerns for when uh, for stowing the OBSS uh, later today um, uh, with regards to uh, not causing more damage? Yeah, we'll uh, be able to stow the, uh, the boom no problem with uh, this uh, snag and the uh, limitation on the uh, panning and tilting of the uh, sensor on the end of it. Uh, stowing the boom, we've got uh, three uh, positions that we structurally attach it to the uh, to the shuttle and the edge of the payload bay, the sill on the starboard side of the payload bay, and uh, those have nothing to do with this pan tilt unit or the uh, cameras that sit on the end of it. Uh, the cameras uh, will be positioned uh, once uh, we get the boom stowed or prior to stowing the boom, uh, but uh, we'll be able to, uh, to stow that no problem. Okay, and uh, with regards to tomorrow's RPM um, and the imagery that the station will take, I, I know you said that you want, you'll be gathering data from that. Usually the, the photographs are mostly focused on um, the underneath of the orbiter, so will the station crew be told to, uh, to also uh, target areas that weren't covered by this late, late inspection set of procedures, um, such as the crew cabin services? Yeah, uh, we're talking about adding a third crew member uh, to the uh, digital still images that we take of Atlantis during the uh, backflip maneuver, uh, which is the uh, rendezvous pitch maneuver. Um, the normal scan pattern that we perform or we have the crew perform uh, of the uh, heat shield includes uh, uh, nose-on images of the uh, heat shield as well as uh, topside images of uh, Atlantis or uh, any, any other approaching shuttle. And then we actually gather some images of the tail end of the, uh, of the shuttle as it approaches because it goes through a full 360. 360 degree backflip. Um, you're right in that the uh, majority of the images are focused on the tile on the lower surface because that's the hottest surface 
uh, and we like to gather overlapping images all the way across the uh, the wing and then the, the mid body and then the nose area um, on the on the tile on the lower surface. But we do actually gather a number of images uh, again nose on top side and, and uh, tail end of the shuttle. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, some is to determine uh, if there's a gap filler sticking out. If you get a nice edge on view, you can see the gap filler poking out the bottom uh, as opposed to a gap filler poking out at you uh, out the uh, front of the, uh, of the heat shield. It's a little harder to determine that. So uh, we'll get uh, good imagery and uh, we'll uh, wait for the right lighting tomorrow. We always do. And uh, at, the, at the appropriate portion of the approach to the International Space Station, we'll gather all the images uh, using both the 400 millimeter uh, digital still camera as well as a, a 400 millimeter with a, a doubler. Uh, we call it the 800 millimeter lens. And then we'll probably have an additional 800 millimeter camera available uh, to uh, focus in um, on uh, some of the areas that uh, we didn't get on the port wing today using the digital camera uh, on, the, uh, on the end of the boom just because of the uh, amount of coverage that we had with the planned uh, wing scans and wing surveys. Great, thank you. Okay, we're back here in Houston. Follow up, Mark. Thank you, uh, Mark Caro for Aviation Week again. Um, if you make a maneuver with the station, would the propulsion source be a progress or some other some other uh, thruster source? Yeah, the, uh, the primary plan uh, right now is to use uh, the Russian portion of the International Space Station, uh, specifically Progress, and then there's a combination of uh, attitude uh, control thrusters and then uh, orbital raise thrusters that we use. And uh, we've coordinated all that work with our uh, Russian counterparts in Moscow. And uh, again, we're carrying a parallel path as to uh, whether or not we actually need to do that. Uh, decision will be made in the next handful of hours uh, leading up to uh, the debris avoidance maneuver if required. Uh, and finally for me, do you recall uh, how how large an object has to be before you can track it? I'm, I'm kind of hazy as to, is it five inches or more or less? Yeah, it's uh, it's smaller than a bread box, but uh, bigger than, uh, you know, bigger than, I don't know, there's, there, there is a limitation on what we can track. Uh, some of that depends on whether or not the, uh, the object is uh, metallic in nature and the color of the material, um, but uh, some of that information I don't readily have available. Okay, I think that wraps up all the questions. So before we close, a few programming notes. Deputy Shuttle Program Manager Leroy Kane, who is the chairman of the mission management team, will hold his first briefing of the flight at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time on NASA television, so you'll want to stay tuned and tune in for that later this afternoon. Atlantis's six crew members begin their sleep period at 6.20 p.m. Central Time, enabling us to begin the airing of our flight day highlights at 7 p.m. Central Time. Those highlights will be replayed every hour on the hour throughout the course of the crew's sleep period this evening. And the wake-up call for Atlantis's crew will come Sunday morning at 2.20 a.m. Central Time as they begin activities for their arrival at the International Space Station a few hours later. You can follow all of the work being conducted by Atlantis's astronauts and the Expedition 23 crew on the International Space Station on our website at www.nasa.gov. With that, we'll call it a briefing and go back to Mission Control for continuing coverage of the STS-132 mission. Thanks very much.